Hi, welcome to Legal Cut Pro, the Canadian entertainment law podcast. My name is Michelle Molyneux. And I'm Greg Pang. Today's podcast is Title Searches with our special guest, Anne-Marie Murphy. But first, we have to give a shout out. We don't have to. No, no, we do have to, but and we want to give we a shout out to. to our sponsor. This podcast is brought to you by Ampia and its professional development team. Special thanks to Jane Toogood, our audio editor. You can find her on Instagram at JJ underscore Toogood. And speaking of Ampia, the Alberta Film and Television Awards this year will be in Calgary on May 23rd at the beautiful Hyatt Regency. Visit ampia.org, that's A-M-P-I-A dot org for more information and tickets. Awesome. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. And we also need to give a special shout out to our podcast supporter, a supporter of this podcast being the Canadian Film Centre, CFC, which is a leading not-for-profit cultural organization for the development and advancement of Canadian creative and entrepreneurial talent in the screen-based industries. CFC's programs and initiatives span film and television, screen acting, composing and songwriting for the screen and digital and immersive media. Visit cfccreates.com for more information. That's cfccreates.com. Awesome. Well, we're really excited to have a friend of the podcast back, Anne-Marie Murphy. And we're fortunate to have interviewed Anne-Marie last summer, summer 2019, about script clearances and are very grateful to have her back today for a discussion on title searches and title reports. Anne-Marie, welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. Good to have you. For anyone who perhaps missed out on the script clearance episode, for one, definitely go take a listen. But Anne-Marie Murphy is the owner and founder of Eastern Script, which is based in Kingston, Ontario. Yes, that's right. And so again, Anne-Marie, welcome back to the podcast. And how have you been since we have last chatted? Sorry. Very good. It's a new year. It's a new decade. Yes, happy new year. Absolutely. (laughs) Thanks for asking. (laughs) So uh, we're so glad to have you back today. This is really exciting. And this episode is actually going to be a little bit of a reverse episode. Um, So instead of us interviewing you and asking you questions, Anne-Marie, you have some questions for us about title searches. Yes. And this was a, an episode, essentially the concept for this episode was pitched by, by you, Anne-Marie, I think a couple months ago, you approached, Hey, why don't we do an episode about title searches. We already talked script clearance reports, but how about title searches, which is the other, one of the other major, I guess, um, uh, service areas that uh, Eastern Script oper- uh, offers. That's right. Okay. So before we dive into that, let's first define what we're talking about. Anne Marie, can you please tell us in your words what a title search is? Sure. I'll give it a try. Uh, I would say, first of all, Title search is not an opinion, it's a research document. And it's, depending on the scope that you select, it's a look at how the title that you want to use has been used in other media. So we look at film projects, you know, theatrical length, longer, you know, 90 90 minute, hour and a half you know, two hour projects, we look at small screen projects, you know, TV series, TV movies, web series, short films. We look at trademark registrations that are related to the film and television industries, copyright registrations. How has your title been used in the world of publishing, books, comic books, periodicals? How about plays, radio programs, the world of music, song titles, album titles? Business names, are there film and television industry related business names that are matches to your title? Domain names, newspaper and magazine articles. And then we also do sort of a general search on the internet looking for anything that might seem relevant that doesn't fall into any of those other categories. So it's a very robust search, um, very methodical. The searches, depending on the scope, can have anywhere from 25 to 100 sources in them we end up presenting you with a list of matching items in each of those categories and we provide the main distinguishing details about the listings we're finding so for example if we find a book by that exact match title we'll tell you the publisher is the year it was published um, the author ditto for you know film titles television titles plays etc so that's what a title search is 
long answer. And uh, you said that there could be uh, how, how many sources sometimes, like 125 sources? Well, we have we offer five different scopes of a title mm -hmm. search. The most detailed one is the global search. Mm -hmm. Then I would say the North American search. Uh, we've got a U.S. option, a Canadian option, and then one that was approved a few years ago at our urging by the insurance companies. Uh, it's called the basic search. And that's a search with quite a bit fewer sources, I think 25 to 30. It covers you for you know film, TV, the main media in which you'll be distributing, but it's it's for low budget folks, you know, things that are going perhaps straight to a film festival. So I'd say the range of sources is anywhere from 25 to over 100. Hmm. Wow. So the more, is it fair to say then, the more comprehensive the title search is uh, correlative of the, the scope of the title search? Yes, for sure. So a basic search we can get done in uh, a small part of a day. A complicated global search can take a day and a half, full day and a half. It can take you know, eight to 12 hours. So that's, that's, I'd say the, the time range. Hmm. Okay, perfect. Well, with that definition in mind, let's talk a little bit about the law behind title searches. What legal considerations are engaged in title searches? So some people might find it a little bit surprising, but the title of a work isn't necessarily protected under copyright law. And a title in itself is not a trademark under trade law. So what we're actually concerned about with in respect of titles is actually a tort called passing off. And for those listeners who don't know, Michelle, what is a tort? A tort is a delicious multi-layered cake <laughs> that is filled with whipped cream. Mmm, <laughs> torts. <laughs> I'm trying to cut out sugar for the new year. <laughs> All I can think of is dessert. Stay away from those torts then, Michelle. <laughs> Let's talk about the tort that's not very so appetizing. Okay. <laughs> Aww. A sugar-free tort in our common oh, law system. <laughs> it is a wrong that can be sued for in a civil action. A familiar tort that most people probably would know about is trespass. So if you directly and physically interfere with someone's possession of property, then you potentially could be liable of trespass. And the tort of passing off is a wrong as well that could lead to civil liability. Now, I have to confess from law school, I totally didn't understand the tort of passing off. So could you explain it a little bit more, Greg? Of course I can. So passing off is, of course, is a uh, actionable tort that could lead to civil liability. And the basic idea behind passing off is that no person can pass off their goods as someone else's. It's about protecting the business from unfair competition and the public from being deceived due to this passing off. But the real question here and relevant for our topic at hand is how does this relate to title searches? How does passing off relate to what a title report would give us? For example, if the title report gives us a result of a play, a popular play with the same title as the chosen title for the film, and if that play is say is you know, similar in subject matter or, or story or something like that. It doesn't even have to be. But the more popular that play is, the more risk that you would run that there could be a potential claim in passing off in that the movie or the TV series with the same title as this popular play is riding on the goodwill and is perhaps deceiving or misdirecting the customers or customers, viewers to their show because of this play that uh, is very popular. However, this is all theoretical, of course. In reality, the tort of passing off is fairly difficult to prove because there is a, a fairly high burden on the plaintiff to meet its case, so to speak. So they have to prove three main elements, that there was goodwill in, their, in, in this context, in the title, there is misrepresentation. Yeah, I actually have to prove misrepresentation, not theoretical misrepresentation. And that there were actual damages sustained by that rights holder. And that, in a nutshell, is passing off. Awesome. Thanks for explaining that, Greg. <laughs> well, I have another question for you. Mm -hmm. um, a common question for us is, which geographic scope do we need? We typically ask the clients to consider their distribution plans and to consult with production counsel 
and or their E&O broker. But what, what factors do you consider in answering that question, Greg? I think it, it, really, it depends on a number of factors. So, uh, and, and you mentioned uh, some, some of them, right? Like one of the major one is the E&O broker. What, what does the uh, insurer require? And the, uh, the scope, and this would dovetail with the scope of the, what the coverage is for the errors and admissions. If it's planned to be a, uh, a release that is going to go global, then it may be advisable and or likely required to conduct a worldwide title search. But oftentimes it's one of those things that it might be good enough for the insurer that it's a North America title search that it can be conducted in terms of scope. Cost is another factor. And this can inform, and uh, Anne Marie, you know better than us than, about the cost, uh, what the, I guess, the uh, 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 step up in prices between the, the different uh, geographic scopes. Yes. So that can become another factor. But oftentimes, what informs the scope of the title search you're going to order is what's required by either the insurer, the broadcaster, or the distributor. So, Anne Marie, I guess we kind of we touched a little bit on uh, the effort differences between conducting a title search as the geographic scope broadens. Um, maybe would you want to share how are the price differences between the different types of scopes? Um, well, as I mentioned before, the basic search is sort of the the most cost effective option. You know, first something that's not going to have a particularly wide release. Um, I would say that the next step up to the U.S. or the Canadian one is probably twice that price. Um, the next step up to all of North America is uh, maybe another 25% more. And then the global search is probably, let's see, close to twice the price of the North American. It's a significant amount of work. So... It's interesting though, because so many things sort of need a global search now, and yet don't budget for them at all. You know, like web series that go, you know, straight to the internet and they're seen by, you know, potentially millions or billions of people. Um, we we've, we've find that there are a lot of emerging producers in, in that realm right now who don't typically uh, budget for this stuff. And then they, they see the prices for the global searches and they go, oh my goodness. So. Um, just throwing that out there as something that's um, concern for you know smaller budget projects that have wide distribution plans. The expense can be significant. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, and it's crazy because we live in such a global society today. So it seems mm -hmm. like probably a lot more people do require the global option. Mm -hmm. We did quite a lot of them last year. I, I mean, I don't know what percentage, but I, I'd say significantly more than the previous year. So I'm wondering if that's um, coming from the insurance side. Mm. And that could well be, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've seen a situation where the insurer is okay with a North American uh, title search, um, and but they'll still cover um, uh, errors and emissions uh, worldwide. That mm -hmm. policy still be worldwide. But uh, you know, risk factors change and marketing conditions change, so it could well have changed or be changing. Yes, and I don't, I don't usually hear from the powers at that level on a regular basis. So um, it would just be anecdotal and observations that lead me to think that, that there's more of a push toward having clients get the global search done. But I'd say the vast majority of the searches we do in the course of the year are the North American search. Mm -hmm. and, and I think uh, for my clients, that's the vast majority of what they end up ordering uh, anyway. Um, yeah, and it's still, it's a very robust search. I mean, you're, we, we do have internet, quite a few international sources in that North American search. So you're covered for a pretty wide area. Now, I, I actually had another question. Um, at what point in production do you recommend a title search be conducted? In my past experience, I found uh, that I was working with a distributor and one of their delivery specifications was a title report that is current and dated no earlier than 30 days prior to delivery date. So to me, it seems like on the one hand, it's probably best to wait, obviously, in until you're close to delivery, so you're within that 30-day period. But at the same time, what would happen if your title's already locked and then you get back the title report that flags a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think I would uh, typically advise uh, doing the title search a little bit earlier. And, and I, may, I may flag the title uh, right away. It's like, hey, uh, don't you think that um, 
you know, Scareface and this being about a gangster movie very close to Scarface, you know, mm -hmm. or something like, I mean, that's a little bit ridiculous, but I, I'd say that the probably a better practice would be to order that title search and give time because the more rush you put on it, the more expensive it gets. Yes. And, <laughs> and so, you know, if we need to turn around a, a global title search within 24 hours, that's going to be either not possible or very expensive, right? Yes. Henry? Yes. yes. <laughs> and we actually don't even provide next day service. Um, three day turnaround is the fastest that we provide. I mean, there have been times when we've got stuff done for people in two days, but three days is our sort of advertised minimum. We do three, five, seven, and 10 business days. I also wanted to add a point that I've observed in the past. There are a lot of reasons why a title might not pan out ultimately. And sometimes it's not even something from the title search. Um, I've had clients who've come back to us for repeats of searches because they found out from their broadcaster that there were things of a similar flavor and a somewhat similar like you know not close enough that we would have found it in the title search but close enough that they were uncomfortable with the title or they didn't like um they didn't they just didn't like the title that had been selected not because there was a conflict so sometimes once you get to the uh, broadcast and distribution level there are other um, things that would throw the title out and send you back to the drawing board and in those situations when people come back to us we usually give them a pretty significant discount we call it the mercy discount. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now I have another question. Do you talk with your clients about doing some of their own research before ordering a full title search? And this is something I typically suggest, you know, that they at least spend some time at IMDb, U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, uh, CEPO in Canada, and, and that they do a robust internet search before going out and paying for one of these full searches. They might that way, in fact, they quite likely will find issues on their own and can avoid having to pay for an additional title search. So I'm wondering about that. I don't think I, that's a really good question, by the way. And I, I don't think I've ever suggested to my client that they go do their own searches. And part of that is um, that they, they might not know how, um, and I'll have to like potentially give them a little bit of training on, uh, you know, give them some links and hey, you could go do this, do this, do this. And then where they, where they have, probably a million other things to do to you know, essentially wrap up the, the entire production, right? Because mm -hmm. we're, we're usually at that stage where right. the title search is like the one of the very last things you do. And it's yes. it unfortunately could be an afterthought. It's like, oh, we still need to do this title search kind of thing. Um, so what I sometimes assist with is, or, or actually typically assist with is I might, um, or I, I would run some of these searches myself and to, do essentially a quick knockout search uh, as a it's a trademark term yes back matches right because i can't i don't have the resources and i'm not being paid as a you know a clearance house like yourself to do, go through a very comprehensive report so i'm just doing a quick knockout search to mm -hmm. uh maybe pre-clear is not the right term but is to uh, eliminate any obvious results I said yes I say, right the ten thousand pound gorillas. You want to. Yes. You want to. You want to avoid those, especially if they're so obvious. Exactly. Yeah. And um, like you know, for example, uh, there's yeah the INDB searches, uh, the trademark searches with the USPTO and CEPO. And if uh, listeners aren't familiar with those terms, uh, I'm. DB, you're probably familiar with Internet Movie Database, uh, United States Patent and Trademark Office, and the Canadian Intellectual Property Office. And I think it's also prudent to do uh, just a, a match search on Amazon. Right? Yes. Yeah. So uh, so just, much there. That's exactly. A good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if something uh, comes up that is problematic, then uh, that could be discussed, or the title could be changed before spending that money on a title search, a uh, full title search. Especially if you're doing something like you know a global title search, which takes time mm -hmm. and a lot more money, right? So mm -hmm. we want to perhaps just eliminate the obvious before yes. we uh, pay for the service. I hadn't even thought of searching Amazon. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I found from the producing side of things that um, you're often doing an internet search uh, in the early stages to develop your marketing and discoverability plan, which seem to be new requirements oh, yeah. for a lot of funders. So yeah. I would say that it might be helpful to kind of for producers, filmmakers to have an eye out for potential kind of title issues or if there are a lot of 
search results that seem to be things similar to your title when you're doing that marketing and discoverability research. Um, and you're also searching to see whether the title is available as a username on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and investigating all of that side of things when you're probably in your early stages of marketing and development. So it might be an idea to kind of keep that in mind that, you know, there could be some title red flags and perhaps consider changing your title early on if you're noticing that red flags are popping up. Mm -hmm. Although obviously a title search is going to be way, way more detailed and extensive. I think just that preliminary step uh, as a filmmaker looking on that internet search and just seeing, are there red flags popping up? Do we mm -hmm. have a good title before we even get to the title search stage? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Now we've had, um, we've had clients in the past. This is an odd question for you. Every once in a while we have a client telling us they're ordering a title search for something that has already been broadcast. And I, I always hang up the phone after those calls and wonder how is that possible? <laughs> I mean, is it, is it likely a case of someone having missed a few items on a checklist, do you think? I think that could totally be possible. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, definitely. There are so many, so many items often on deliverables checklist that I think I could definitely see someone missing it or maybe mm -hmm. not understanding exactly what a title search is. So thinking, oh, maybe I don't need to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and for the listeners, you do. <laughs> um, also, I think it, it could possibly be the case that there has been initial broadcast and maybe that broadcaster didn't request a title search. And so perhaps it's later on down the line that there's another distributor, maybe insurance wasn't quite in place yet. And then they've realized, oh, we actually need this title search done. Mm, okay. All good points. Yeah. I've run into that situation, uh, that exact situation, Michelle, about, you know, like the broadcaster, uh, it, maybe it was a, a limited, um, local VOD release or something like that. Right. And the title search was just not necessary, especially considering the, the, the budget. Um, so, and then the later consideration, then it gets picked up for distribution on a wider scope. And then the distributor mm -hmm. requires a title search. So that ha I have seen that happen before. And we sometimes are asked by clients, you know, if I get this uh, basic search now and then I find out um, later that we should have gone broader, you know, how do you treat that? So I'll say to them, well, typically, you know, we'll just split the difference with you. If you come back to us, you know, we'll do the rest of the research and we'll turn it into the scope. The, the broader scope that you need. But the only problem there is the stale dating that can happen with title searches. You know, you can't, you can't do a, a basic search in February of 2018 and then, you know, add to it two years later because the contents of that original report need to be redone. Wow. Um, well, absolutely. Yeah. And then sometimes I've had uh, producers uh, think that, oh, we have to get it again because it's like the third season and we have to get a new title search every season that we produce this show but because there's like a two-year gap between when you're producing it and of course the accordingly the the releases right so the the results like, like you said that Marie, they'll they'll change yes it's more out there <laughs> like there's all more potential conflict out there yes so you have already broadcast that show broadcast you should be or released that show under that title mm -hmm. Um, now, I have a different question, and this is related to legal opinions. Now, those don't seem to be commonly needed in Canada. It seems to be more the case in the U.S. So I'm wondering if you provide legal opinions on title searches and if you can explain what they consist of and maybe speak to this difference between the needs in the two different countries. I don't think I could speak toward uh, to the specifically to the uh, particular needs and the differences between the two countries but i can speak to when i've been required or been requested to provide an uh, opinion on a title report that's when there's there are results that show up and the uh, the insurer or the broadcaster uh, is or distributor is concerned it's like look this title looks pretty close to this book or this magazine or the, mm -hmm. these or these multiple matches can you get your lawyer to give us an opinion to give an opinion on this and that so that we're not we're not worried about this so that this is clear 
And that those are situations where I've been asked to provide an opinion. And for that kind of thing, I typically have to dig a little bit deeper. And usually in the title reports, they do provide some information about what they are. And then I will go and, and search out specifically what this book was about. And then I'll query the client and say, hey, is there any connection here? You know, uh, between this book and and uh, your, your production and and so on, and so on, and to eliminate the possibility or to minimize that the the risk that there is a, can be some kind of claim um, because of the, the the chosen title in the future. Mm, interesting. So that sounds like it's fairly time consuming. Uh, it, it can be, uh, depending on what the results are. And uh, I haven't run into a situation where the results were uh, so extensive. I, I had to spend like, you know, 20 hours on it. That I think the last time I dealt with it, maybe there were two or three results that I had to look a little bit more deeper mm-hmm. into. And the time consuming part is if they require an actual formal letter you know, on my letterhead with the opinion on it, mm-hmm. know, addressed to the, um, the, the broadcaster or the distributor or, or the insurer. Okay. Now, um, I guess I also wanted to mention about something that has struck me in the past. There's so many possibilities for us finding issues for a title in one of our reports. You know, the more common the title, the more things we have to wade through in order to confirm you know, that it's a safe one for you to use. So, you know, conversely, we sort of laugh here at the irony of the title search reports we prepare that have zero results. You know, they're very tiny. It's a, just a slim little stack of paper and they have hardly any findings in them. So they look like you've paid for a lot of nothing, <laughs> but, but that's of course the best possible news. Um, you know, your, your title is unique and that, that frankly doesn't happen that often. I, I can count on one hand how many title reports we've sent out that had zero results in the last few years. But um, as a lawyer, what are you looking for in a title search report? When you get these reports from the clearance, the title search companies, what, what are your eyes running toward? Mainly matches is sort of like how I was, uh, how I was just speaking about uh, what is close or is something that it, it looks maybe suspiciously um, similar. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then so and that that's where it would uh, raise the flag for me to do, do a little bit more digging. And usually I know, at least in your title reports, that there there is enough information there for me to know what it's exactly what it's referring to. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes I've seen title reports where it's like just says uh, it won't even give me, say, an ISBN for the book. It was, you know, and, and I'd have to do all sorts of extra searches, right? So, um, but yeah, usually it's just uh, close matches or matches or, or something similar mm-hmm. that will cause me to investigate. And, uh, and, and a lot of times these, these wouldn't take too long to essentially knock out. Right. Now, um, I guess my last question is what, what do you look for in a title search provider? What, what kind of credentials are you looking for? Ooh, hmm. I don't know. I, I, I you just gone to you, Anne Marie, because we trust. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> we just go to you. <laughs> um, you know, I haven't. Uh, well, maybe I should put it a different way. How would you suggest a person go shop for a title search company? I think that what I have heard uh, is that, and I'm not going to name um, any any names, any of your competitors, Anne Marie is. Uh, is the inf- how the information is presented in the title reports. Mm-hmm. So uh, what I've heard from clients is that sometimes they can't make heads or tails of a title report. It's so long. It's like, what are we looking at here? So they're looking for what's something. I know sometimes these can be long because there can be many, many sources and many results. But how am I able to digest these in a way that it won't make me like going to fall asleep within the first you know, 10 minutes, <laughs> you know, or at least it makes some kind of logical sense that it's not so hard to read. Right. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I, when I, uh, so when I've talked to clients, it's about or, the organization of the title report itself. And sometimes okay. it can be such a dog's breakfast to even make like, again, make heads or tails of. Okay. Interesting. Mm-hmm. So do you want something user friendly in addition to full of detail? Yeah. And, you know, all the other factors too, you know, cost, you know, t- uh, uh, responsiveness, um, uh, timeliness uh, and uh, uh, customer service and, you know, s- stuff like that. Right. So right. it's uh, but I think one of the number one things is because, you know, several eyes have to look at these title searches and script clearance reports is like, how is it organized? Is it logical? Uh, do they make 
I know you're not allowed, you, you can't give legal advice, but do they make suggestions on alternatives and, and stuff like that? So it's, uh, yeah, those kind of factors have, I've heard are, are important for producers. Well, this was a very interesting conversation for me. It's good to have some of these questions answered. We were posed quite a few of them on a regular basis. So I am grateful to both of you for taking the time to entertain me in this way. <laughs> Oh, thank no, you thank so you much. for your time, Henry. It's, uh, mm. This is a very good topic to discuss. Uh, we had it as an idea to discuss at some point, but uh, I, I think I can speak for both of us and say we're, we're happy that you uh, reached out to us to say, hey, let's do something on, on this topic. Excellent. Well, glad to be of service. <laughs> I hope it's helpful to others. I was going to say it's always a treat to have you on the pod. You're so knowledgeable, and it's so great chatting with you. Well, I thank you. <laughs> so, Henry, where can people find you? Uh, we are on Twitter at mm-hmm. Eastern Script. Uh, we are at a very well-packed website full of information, easternscript.com. We've got a toll-free number that works all over the place, 844-842-3999. And um, there's all kinds of email contact information at the website as well. Those are the best ways to find us. Excellent. And just to close this out, uh, a thank you once again, Anne-Marie. And for listeners, please subscribe, leave feedback us on, uh, on us, for us on, and rate us on iTunes or Apple Podcasts and keep listening. And hopefully, hopefully this is a, a, a very interesting topic for you to, to, <laughs> to, to listen to our pod, humble podcast. Uh, Michelle, um, I suppose we should just wrap this up with where can people find us? Yeah, people can find you, Greg. They can email you, greg at legalcutpro.com. And they can also find you on Twitter at PsychLaw. You can find me on Instagram at Michelle Molyneux or email michelle at legalcutpro.com. Perfect. Thank you, Michelle. Once again, Emery, thank you very much. You're so welcome. Until the next time. Thanks for listening. Legal Cup Pro has been produced by Greg Pang and Michelle Molyneux. Excerpts of Just Say Go, Dr. Octavo, Mendicity, mixed courtesy of Dr. Octavo and Michelle Molyneux. This podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only. Nothing stated on it is to be construed as legal advice. The views expressed by the hosts of Legal Cup Pro and any guests are their own and do not represent the opinions of any organization or other person unless otherwise stated. Intro sound clip film projector countdown has been truncated from its original form and is copyright 2013 Ivan Gabovich used under Creative Commons BY3 license. Outro sound clip film projector reel runs out by Stefan021 is used under Creative Commons CC01.0 license. This podcast is copyright of Red Frame Law and is licensed to you under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial CC BYNC 4.0 license. For details of that license, visit creativecommons.org.